Um, welcome to this Robert Menzies Institute event tonight on early Cold War migration and its impact on Australia. I am Georgina Downer. I'm the CEO of the Robert Menzies Institute here at the University of Melbourne. I um, firstly do want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional owners of the land on which the Institute and the University stands. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. Uh, before we get into the event, and I know that there is a lot of excitement to hear from um, Professor Ederly, um, I do want to just indulge, um, get you to indulge me a bit and just speak a little bit about the Robert Menzies Institute, particularly for those who are new to our events. We are Australia's sixth prime ministerial library and museum and we like our name suggests uh, represent the life and legacy of Robert Menzies who was Australia's longest serving prime minister. Uh, we uh, are established here at Melbourne University for a number of reasons. One Robert Menzies was a student here from 1913 to 1918. He was a law student and very involved in campus life and all the, uh, the debates that went on here. He was president of the Melbourne University Student Council, editor of the Melbourne University magazine, heavily involved in the conscription debate that took place at the time. And some of you may have attended an event we had earlier this year with Professor Joy Damusi on that very issue. Uh, Robert Menzies obviously went on to have a very successful career in politics at the state and federal level. He was also a barrister in Australia's youngest ever King's Council. Um, but after that, he returned to Melbourne University as Chancellor from 1967 to 72. And uh, he, he did love this university so much that a couple of years before he passed, he approached the Vice-Chancellor at the time and offered his personal library of over 4,000 books to the university to join the collection in the Bailey. It sits there to this day in the Lee Scott room on the first floor of the Bailey Library and you, you can visit it under some sort of level of restrictions. But one of the things we do at the Robert Menzies Institute is give you the opportunity to see these books in person and we have an exhibition in the old quad uh, in two rooms and rotate that every six months and there's an amazing selection of books of books there and um, they really are a, re a unique insight into what Sir Robert Menzies was thinking at the time, uh, the influences on his life and on Australian Australian life at the time. So I really do welcome welcome you and encourage you to come and visit us in the old quad. One of the books in the Menzies collection, and it's not on display at the moment, but it, it will be, is Hell Moved Its Border. And it's a 1960 account by a Romanian refugee to Australia of his time in the Siberian Gulag. As he says in this book of migration to Australia, having reached the free world, a world in which it is still possible to think, write and speak freely, a world which still controls its own resources, which is still the possessor of a spontaneous culture undictated by government and of the Christian religion and the charity implicit in it, I feel an urge which springs from the very depths of my being to tell the world. The Menzies era, particularly the, se the second part from 1949 to 66, was a period of huge political, social and economic change in Australia. And much of this had to do with the two million migrants who came to Australia during that period, many of whom were displaced people from, from Europe. Um, this migration took place in the very early stages of the Cold War and that fear of communism in Australia and more broadly amongst Western countries prevailed and that was very much enhanced by the personal experiences of some of the migrants who came to Australia. These migrants were meeting a really urgent workforce need in Australia and we of course experienced that today um, after the COVID uh, shutdown and block blockages of our borders. They also contributed to a really changing Australian identity. It was still a period of white Australia policy and this had bipartisan commitment for many years um, across the Labor and Liberal parties and its precursors. The white Australia policy began to be dismantled in 1958 and, and onwards, still in the Menzies era. 
Tonight to speak to us about these issues is Professor Mark Ederly. Mark, who I'm sure is known to many of you in this room, is the inaugural Hanson Professor in History at the University of Melbourne. He's also Deputy Dean in the Faculty of Arts. He is a historian of the Soviet Union and its successor states, in particular Russia, and of course of late has been a commentator on the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and I have no doubt, given the passing of Mikhail Gorbachev yesterday, we'll have something to say about his legacy too. Um, tonight's event is a public one. It is being recorded. Mark will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have uh, some Q&A. So thank you very much, Mark. Welcome. Um, thank you, Georgina, for this introduction. Um, as you can see from the slide, I've been invited to speak today to you about the early Cold War migration and its impact on Australia. Now, those of you who know something about my work might wonder why I accepted this uh, invitation, because I'm coming to this topic somewhat from the sidelines. I'm not a historian of migration. I'm not a historian of Australia. I'm not even Australian. <laughs> Um, and there are colleagues in the audience today who are much better qualified than I am to speak about uh, many of these issues. Um, but I'm not completely ignorant uh, about what I'll be speaking about. Um, I'm a historian of the Soviet Union, and I'm in particular interested in uh, the Soviet Second World War, uh, which was uh, strongly um, defined by mass displacements within the Soviet Union and beyond uh, the Soviet space. Uh, this work has culminated in the book Stalinism at War, uh, and it uh, focuses very much on uh, displacements. Um, and in this book I wrote, and I modestly quote myself here, this war, the Soviet Second World War, is still very much alive today in the lands once ruled by Stalin. Its echoes reverberate well beyond the region, however. This war's displacements did not stop at the changing Soviet borders. They transcended them, deported Poles left to Iran in 1942, Russian, Ukrainian, Lithuanian, Latvian, and Estonian displaced persons evaded repatriation and stayed in the West. Polish and Baltic Jews returned from the Soviet Union to their homeland only to leave once they found an anti-Semitic graveyard there. They all took their stories of this war to their new homes in Australia, Canada, the United States, Latin America, or Israel. Anybody who teaches the history of this war in any of these places will regularly encounter students who are attracted to it because it's theirs. It's the history of their grandfather or grandmother, the history of their family, the history of their community. End of self-quotation. So along the way to this book, uh, in the libraries and archives I consulted, and in the classrooms where I taught this history in Melbourne, but also before I came here in Perth in Western Australia, I discovered the many ways in which this history was deeply linked with the country which had welcomed me in 2004 as a newly minted lecturer in European history and, as I sometimes joke, a refugee from the German academic system. And this country has welcomed me, as it has many other uh, immigrants over the decades uh, here and has become both my home and the home of my family now two decades later. Now, one such discovery on the way to this book uh, was the history of, a very intriguing history, of Polish Jews who survived World War II because Stalin had deported them as class enemies. Now, you wouldn't think that's a great event in your life if you're being deported by Stalin as a class enemy, and it could well end lethally for you, this history. Um, and it did for many, but it removed them inadvertently from the ma much more systematic genocide or the actual systematic genocide of the Germans um, when they 
invaded Poland. So these Polish Jews who were deported to uh, the Soviet Union as class enemies survived very often in the Soviet hinterland and they would form the core of what was left of Poland's Jews after the Nazi genocide. Many of them, as it turns out, ended in Melbourne. When we, re when we presented the results of a collaborative research project of which this book on the screens uh, is one, when we presented this history at Monash University some years ago, audience members rose to tell us that this was their history, the history of their grandparents or parents, a history of which they knew some aspects but were keen to learn more. And that has been very much the experience with this book, that people uh, contact us and, and say, this is, this is my family history as well. So that was one such discovery. Um, another were the Polish rats of Tobruk, a history Lucina Atimiuk, one of my postgraduate research students, and typically for this kind of history, the daughter of one of these men is working on at the moment. These were Polish servicemen of the Brigade of Carpathian Riflemen who had escaped both the Germans and the Soviets and fought alongside British and Australian troops in the Siege of Tobruk in 1941. After lobbying by their Australian comrades in arms, some 1,500 of them were resettled to Australia in 1947. The largest number of them went to Tasmania, uh, but there were also smaller groups who came to other states. And in Victoria, they were mostly sent to work in the timber industry in remote parts of the state. So more generally, I discovered on the way to this book about the Soviet Second World War, how deeply the displacement from the Soviet orbit had shaped post-war Australian society. This is the history of displaced persons, or DPs, who began to change the migration pattern to this country. And there's some preliminary evidence which Atimiuk explores in her doctoral research, uh, which is taking place within the history uh, discipline here, that the resettlement of the Carpathian riflemen provided a model for this subsequent scheme. Now, this is still somewhat hypothetical, but that is uh, a possible um, path. This scheme um, was a consequence of the complex histories of the often violent population displacements of World War II in Europe. After the war and post-war repatriation, about one million displaced persons remained in Western Europe. These were men, women, and children displaced from countries now under communist rule who did not wish to return there. The International Ref Refugee Organization, the IRO, tried to find new homes for them all over the world in a program which was called the Mass Resettlement Scheme. Australia, then still a nation uh, of only 7.4 million, took the largest number of DP, the second largest number of DPs in the world, 170,000, after the United States. In addition, maybe 20,000 Jews arrived outside of the scheme and despite serious anti-Semitic pressures to keep them out. Add former white Russians, so anti-Bolshevik Russians who had fought during the civil war against the Bolsheviks, who left their temporary home in China after the victory of the communists there, um, which were probably about 5,000 throughout the 1950s, and you get a tally of nearly 200,000 uh, people who arrived from Eastern, Eastern Europeans or people who had lived under the, under the uh, Russian Empire um, and then subsequently the Soviet Union uh, who arrived here. So these Eastern European migrants together made up at least 2% of the population in the 1950s. That's not an insignificant share. And in the wor wor words of historian John Hurst, quote, a startlingly new element in British Australia. By 1961, the population had grown to over 10.6 million, 
and 8% of them were now non-British migrants, mostly Poles and Germans, Greeks and Italians. The multicultural Australia we live in today began to take shape then. Why did the Australian government, historically intent on preferring British migrants, suddenly let in all of these East Europeans? The chief reason was that the war induced fear that Australia might not be able to defend itself without a larger population. And the subsequent realization that the necessary numbers were unlikely to come from, from Britain. The or origins of this policy were thus laid during the war under the Curtin government and the realization that non-British people needed to be allowed in came under Chifley. The first 843 DPs arrived in the ship wonderfully named General Heinzelmann in November 1947. They had been very carefully selected and were celebrated in a well-curated propaganda campaign as Beautiful Bolts, and that became the, the title of uh, this uh, book by Jane Persian, The Beautiful Bolts. So, not scary East Europeans, but Beautiful Bolts implicitly, you know, Aryans, um, blonde, blue-eyed, um, muscular. Um, so this policy was then continued under the Menzies government. Uh, so this is basically uh, an, an example of uh, a bipartisan policy on immigration, if you like, uh, which went on between these governments. Now, who were these new Australians? The answer is far from straightforward, as Sheila Fitzpatrick, who is in the audience, has discussed in detail in her recent book on Russian migration, which is uh, also on this slide, uh, White Russians, Red Peril. Let's say a man was born in 1922 in independent Latvia to a Russian father and a Jewish mother. Was this man a Latvian? Was he a Russian or was he Jewish? He had equal claim to be any of these things, right? So he could, depending on how he felt in certain circumstances, claim any of these uh, nationalities. And Jewish is, in the Soviet context, a nationality. That would be in your passport under nationality, would be Jewish, right? So one part of this story is that national identities in Eastern Europe are very, very complex. Um, uh, they are also in the Soviet Union are very complex, which also has to do with uh, Soviet nationality policy as well. However, there were other pressures which increased the complications about these identities. The Allied repatriation policies, the Australian preferences for laborers and beautiful bolts, the implications of some of the migrants in Nazi crimes during the war, and the sudden shift to anti-communism in the West after Soviet victory over the Nazis, all of these pressures combined and conspired to encourage the new arrivals to edit their biographies if necessary. Consider the story of Ivan Nikitich Kononov, a man whose fate I have chronicled at some length in my book Stalin's Defectors of 2017, and about whom my colleague Oleg Beda, who is also in the audience, has written very insightfully as well. Kononov was a career soldier under Stalin, who, when the war went badly um, for the Soviet side in the summer of 1941, defected across the front line and became an enthusiastic collaborator of the Germans, for whom he hunted communist partisans in Yugoslavia and elsewhere. Really whom he wanted to fight were the Soviets, but, uh, and he did that at times, uh, particularly partisans, um, so guerrillas behind the front lines, but the Germans were very, very reluctant to let him and his men fight the Soviets directly. After the war, he avoided repatriation, and with it certain execution by the Soviets, as happened to some uh, other military collaborators of similar and higher stature than him, he 
managed to avoid this repatriation um, and he languished for a while in Germany where he acquired a new identity as Ivan Gorsky. And that is the man who have at the, at the bottom there, Ivan Gorsky, a Polish DP. And as this person, he arrived as a Pole rather than a Russian or a Cossack identities which had shaped his wartime persona, right? Kononov was not alone. We have two sets of statistics on the composition of Soviet citizens who arrived in Australia. One come from the usually well-informed Soviet authorities, the other from the Australian immigration officials who I think were a little bit less well-informed, in fact. Um, interestingly, they agree basically on the overall numbers. So I want to walk you, this is a fairly convoluted table here, um, but I'll, I'll just highlight some things. So if you look at the overall numbers, the two sets about, are about the same. They're in the same ballpark. Uh, the Soviets think they lost some 50,000, and that's the thinking of the Soviets. They lost, these are people, they are our people, we lost them to the Australians. Uh, um, uh, some 50,000 or so. The Australians count uh, 52,000. So where the 2,000 come from, I'm actually not totally sure. This, I don't have a good theory about uh, the increase, but the ballpark is basically the same, right? The interesting part is in the details. So these are about the same, right? Look at the number of Russians. So the Soviets think that nearly 6,000 Russians uh, left for Australia. The Australians count uh, 3,200. Where are the all? Uh, where have all the Russians gone? Right? You might ask. Well, they have quietly become something else. They've become Estonians or Latvians, for example, uh, who you see increase in numbers uh, from the Soviet to the Australian, um, or very often they have become Ukrainians uh, who also increase. So sometime between leaving the Soviet orbit and arriving in Australia, many of them had transformed from Russians into Ukrainians or Balts. This transformation was partially an effect of the complex national identity many of them had, which I referred to earlier. So some of them might well have had uh, an equal claim uh, to be a Russian or a Ukrainian because, you know, mommy was Ukrainian, daddy was a, a Russian or something. Um, but it was also prompted by the migrants' strategic decisions their reading of what identity would be most likely first to save them from being repatriated to the Soviet Union, where they didn't want to go, and then secure them passage to Australia. Um, so the repatriation policies were that any Soviet citizen would be returned, whether or not they wanted to, uh, to the Soviets, except people who had not been Soviet citizens before um, World War II began. So that means uh, Ukrainians from the formerly Polish regions of Ukraine, which had been uh, um, taken at the beginning of World War II, and people from the Baltic countries, right? They were not forcibly repatriated. So if you claimed any of these identities, and in the Ukrainian case, it's then slowly by a kind of category creep extended more or less to all Ukrainians, which meant if you were Russian, you didn't want to go back, you, it would be a much safer bet to say you're a Ukrainian and then you wouldn't be forced to go back to uh, Stalin. And people were scared of going back uh, because they expected to go to Gulag uh, or worse. Now there's, one can add a long footnote here that in reality, this was not actually as terrible for most as they expected. But, you know, they had every reason to expect uh, terrible things uh, coming back. So many of them clearly edited their biography um, and entered under sort of false identities, if you like. And today, many of our contemporaries would be scandalized by such biographical editing. Migrants lying to the immigration authorities. Unheard of subterfuge and identity fraud. At the time, Australian authorities were much more relaxed about encountering people whose identities kept changing. 
When Konstantin Nikolaevich Gavrilov migrated to Australia in 1949, he had acquired a compound biography which made no sense whatsoever. Gavrilov had been a mid-level functionary in Stalingrad. A series of events beyond his control led to his displacement to the German side, where he made the best of his opportunities. He was an engineer. The, Soviets, uh, the Germans needed engineers as much as the, the Soviets did. And he made kind of a career on the German side during the war. Gavrilov, as far as one can tell from his memoirs and his diaries, which he schlepped around Europe uh, the entire time, he cared about two things, mommy and being an engineer. He cared about Stalin's Soviet Union only insofar as this was the place where his mother lived and where he had acquired his profession and could uh, work in it. At the end of the war, he had lost his mother, who had died during the war, and found himself displaced to Bavaria. There, he made up a new identity as a Russian emigre, one of those white Russians, right? As a Russian emigre who had fought the Soviets in the Civil War, had lost his wife and alleged child in a bombing raid at the beginning of World War II, and had then been deported by the Germans ahead of the advancing Red Army, because deported was better, right, because you were a victim than if you said, oh, I went and worked with them. So this was a good new identity, because if accepted, it kept him from being deported because the old, to back to the Soviet Union, because the old emigres didn't underlie the repatriation uh, policy, because they were not Soviet citizens when the war began, right? This new identity was duly recognized by an IRO official in Munich and thus saved him from a compulsory repatriation to the land of the Soviets. This is a totally typical story. It happens all the time after the war. Right? Now, the problem was that he still wanted to be an engineer. So, and his engineering degree was from a Soviet university. So he had his Soviet graduation certificate also recognized by another IRO official, but I think in the same building in Munich. So he went like in one office for his new identity, in the other office with his uh, Soviet um, graduation certificate. Now, of course, his Soviet degree made absolutely no sense if you accepted his new biography because he had never been in the Soviet Union, couldn't have had a Soviet engineering degree. Uh, so as a, his new identity as an emigre anti-Bolshevik who never lived in the Soviet Union, uh, didn't square with his, his professional identity, which was the, the thing after his mother's death he cared about most, right, being an engineer. So when he then faced Australian immigration, he had a choice to make between this new identity, which was, you know, a safe bet, and his ability to be an engineer. And remarkably, he took the risk to choose the latter. And he presented, he brought all of the documentation he had about his various identities to this interview um, and decided to present something much closer to his actual biography to the Australian immigration official. This was a very risky decision, right? Um, as he related in his unpublished memoirs. But what could he do? Uh, all he wanted to be was an engineer, and his engineering degree was Soviet. The engineering official, and this is quoting from his memoir, looked at my papers, then looked me straight in the eye. You're a collaborator. You, as an engineer, helped the Germans to fight against us. But then he basically said, welcome to Australia, and gave him uh, an e a visa anyway, uh, and Gavrilov sailed for his new home. Whatever their real identities, the new arrivals shaped Australia in various ways. As Georgina said at the, the outset, the massive influx of Eastern Europeans with first-hand experience of Soviet rule reinforced the spread of anti-communist sentiments and, in fact, anti-socialist sentiments in the developing Cold War. The DPs, writes Fitzpatrick, quote, brought to Australia by a Labour government, generally had no sympathy with Labour and contributed to keeping the party out of, out of power for decades. This conservative impact was well understood by some on the Australian left. The Communist Party, 
um, was staunchly opposed to East European immigration in the post-war years, and some unions campaigned strenuously against the Balts, which was a label slapped on all East European migrants because of that early propaganda campaign about the beautiful Balts. Now all, you know, Poles, Russians, Ukraine all became Balts in, uh, in, in uh, the Australian sort of public consciousness. The perception and quite possibly the reality that anti-communist East European refugees were anti-union and tended to vote not just against communists but also against labor left some deep resentments among parts of the Labour Party who after all had invited them in. What started as a labor policy in the war and post-war years seemed to have benefited the other side of politics by the 1960s and 70s. Decades after the war, when pressured to do something about Vietnamese refugees, Gough Whitlam, for one, reportedly fumed, and I quote, I'm not having hundreds of fucking Vietnamese bolts coming into this country with their religious and political hatreds against us. In another instance, he reportedly referred to Asian bolts who vote anti-labor. So the notion of bolts became one about anti-communist refugees uh, who are uh, coming here. And, you know, I mean, he was probably right that uh, this didn't help his side of politics. As important as the real or perceived anti-communist sentiments of the new arrivals was the impact of the example on the long-term migration policy in this country. The beautiful Balts, the Polish Jews, the white Russians, and the Polish soldiers integrated well often did not talk much about their past and became quite normal Australians. After completing their mandatory, mandatory two-year work contracts, usually in remote regions of the country, they found jobs, started businesses, built homes, often by their own hands, and brought up their children, who more often than not went to the then still free universities. Thus, Theirs was an experience not only of integration, but also of the upward mobility this country is so proud of. This experience with these non-British migrants um, helped pave the way for a different kind of immigration, allowing a much more diverse non-Anglo peoples to become part of this nation. As James Jupp wrote in his Standard History of the Making of the Australian People, the DPs of the years 47-53 were the first wave of non-British migrants replenishing Australia's population. They were followed by Northern Europeans in the 1950s, Southern Europeans in the 50s and 60s, and, quote, since the early 1970s, migrants from any source provided they have met fairly strict criteria concerning age, occupation, education, health, and employment prospects. And we're, of course, in the middle of a debate about exactly that. Uh, again. But there's a third aspect of this post-war migration, an aspect which is neither well understood nor well integrated into Australian public discourse about the past. Australian non-indigenous historical memory focuses on the Anglo part of the population, the British Australian experience of the 20th century. The central war this nation remembers continues to be World War I. It's the sacrifices of the Anzacs which are remembered as making this nation, not the persistence, resourcefulness, and resilience of refugees who sought and found refuge from despots, warlords, and genocide. This Anglo-centric historical memory is increasingly irrelevant to a larger and larger share of the population. As of 2013, 28% of Australians, Australia's resident population was born overseas, and only 8% in the UK or New Zealand. This leaves 20% to whom the Anzac myth has little to offer. By 2011, 43% had at least one overseas-born parent, and again, often not from the UK. Once we take into account the descendants of the many non-Anglo migrants ever since World War II, we talk about a very sizable share of the population indeed. Only about half of the population can claim descent from British and Irish immigrants who had arrived before 1930, says Judd. Uh, not Judd, Jupp. The other half of Australians all vote, pay taxes, and contribute to the common wheel in myriad ways. They are, in other words, 
members of this nation. But the major non-indigenous non national myth, the Anzac legend and World War I, has absolutely nothing to do with who they are and where they came from. They remember other wars, the wars their families experienced, other sacrifices, other struggles. Australia has not really come to terms with this diversity of historical memory among its population. Partially, this lack of attention is caused by the fact that the memory of the displacements of World War II was kept under wraps by those who experienced it. Sometimes this was because their personal history implicated them in one way or another with what the Soviets or the Nazis had done. As Mark Arons has pointed out in two important books, some of the displaced persons who arrived after the war were indeed war criminals. Others had a clearly Soviet past, like Gavrilov, which they did not want to advertise in their new staunchly anti-communist homeland. And in many cases, complex wartime biographies meant that the Nazi collaborators, the former Stalinists, and the refugees were one and the same people, as in the ca case of Kononov. But the lack of public and sometimes also private memory of the war which brought them to Australia not always had such, such cynical origins. More often, the sheer trauma of this experience and the pressures to fit into a society which did not understand them muted the new Australians. It is only now that the descendants of the DPs of World War II begin to uncover their heritage. Some of them are being trained as professional historians at the University of Melbourne as we speak, and we can look forward to their contributions to the public discourse about Australia's many pasts. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, um, I do want to ask you some questions about that excellent presentation, but could I first um, prevail upon you to give some reflections on um, the legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev, because that's obviously been dominating the news mm. over the last 12 hours since we've all been awake and heard it coming out of out of Russia and um, I have no doubt you'll have had some thoughts even though I know you've had an incredibly busy day. Well I escaped <laughs> having to comment on this at all so I think Sheila, I think Sheila, Sheila is totally yeah. ready to do it because she's done it the whole day. Um, uh, yeah I was I was busy being a, a university bureaucrat and therefore escaped all uh, media um, appearances um, well, the legacy, you know, obviously the, the one legacy is the end of the Cold War, um, which also meant, you know, the end of the division of Europe, the end of the division of Germany, uh, the end of the Soviet Empire, outer Soviet Empire in the first instance uh, in 1989 in Europe. And he is fondly remembered by Europeans and other Westerners for that. The other legacy, of course, is the unsuccessful attempt to save Soviet socialism from itself, uh, the breakdown of the Soviet Empire and the Soviet Union into 15 successor states, uh, and the economic destruction that brought with it to the region which was worse than the Great Depression. Um, much worse uh, than the Great Depression in terms of economic collapse. And he's not fondly remembered for that, uh, in particular in Russia. Um, he's more fondly remembered probably in Ukraine, I would imagine, because independent Ukraine <laughs> came out of this, and certainly uh, in the Baltics. So he was... It, I haven't followed what the reactions to his death were in Russia today. Um, it would be interesting to see because he has become very, very unpopular in um, in the largest of the fifteen successor states. Uh, so the kind of nearly cult status he has as a hero of the West in many ways. The flip side of that is that pretty much for the same reasons, nearly uh, he is um, he is not remembered very fondly in 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 Russia in particular, but I think also in some other successor states. So, uh, 
Thank, thank you. And and just um, briefly, again, on this um, legacy, what are your thoughts now on so the passing of Gorbachev, but of course, uh, a, a new Cold War with Russia, where mm. we have sanctions against Russia on the mm. Um, invasion of Ukraine. Um, once again, mm. Russia is front of mind for mm. strategic thinkers in the United States and across the um, liberal democratic world, Europe, mm. Australia and, and others. Um, is, is, is his passing a, a stark reminder of how much things have, dis, have returned to, to the bad old days of great power strategic competition mm. and uh, we sort of mourn for the the positive, mm. Mm. Um, you know, reset of the late eighties. Yes, I mean that would be nice, wouldn't it? Uh, but the, I mean, in a way, the war in Ukraine and other kind of wars Russia is engaged in now, you know, smaller regional military disputes. Um, and the general attempt to bring the region back under kind of Russian control in one way or another, not necessarily by rebuilding the Soviet Union, but by, you know, being the regional hegemon there. Um, what we're seeing in a way is a, is a delayed, a delayed wars of the Soviet succession, um, which I mean, everybody was very happy that there were no major wars or civil wars coming out of. Well, there 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 were some smaller ones, but um, and 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 you're really bloody ones like like in in Chechnya, um, two very bloody wars, um, to which Putin's rise is also linked to the second of those. But in you know, in general, if one thinks about the disintegration of empires, very often there is violent conflict coming out of this. Um, and that was, by and large, not the case. Um, so what happened in Yugoslavia, for example, could have happened on a, on a larger scale uh, in Russia. And in a way, uh, that was, because, was also because the most powerful state in the region was quite weak, was actually initially kind of anti-imperial. You know, the, 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 a prevailing um, mood among Russian intellectuals and politicians uh, in the 1990s was, oh, good, we're, we're rid of all of the, you know, all of these terrible people, this empire where, where we have to pay all the time. And these, these national minorities all get, you know, special treatment because they, there was affirmative action for minority nationalities and university admissions and this, that, and the other thing, right? So the, the, the sense was that, oh, you know, a lot of our economic problems are because we pay for these for these non-Russians all the time, uh, and the hope that this would be that you know decolonization would be in Russia's favor then didn't turn out to be the case. So with a rebuilding of the Russian state and the state really disintegrated in many ways in after 1991 for several years, which led to violence on the street and all of that stuff, right? Um, and with the rebuilding of the power of the Russian state, in a way, we now see a delayed kind of uh, beginning of these military conflicts. So that might just go on for a while until, well, either the Russian empire is rebuilt in some way or Russia decolonizes itself and says it's actually fine if other states are independent and do what they want. Um, that's not our problem, but that will take a, either either of those outcomes will take a while. Um, mm. Mm. I fear. Um, well, Mark, th thank you so much for your presentation tonight. Thank, thanks for having um, me. We we have all, I'm sure, learned a lot, uh, and um, we'll take a lot of those stories back and think deeply on on the impact they've had on Australia as we know today, and the people who walk among us, or and the grandchildren, no doubt of some of these migrants who walk among us and how they've contributed to our nation uh, and, and continue to do so. I wanted to offer you as a token of our thanks a, um, a bottle of Menzies wine from your lover. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and um, yeah, thank you so much for, you. for all thanks. you did for us tonight. Yeah. Really thanks appreciate for it. Me. Thanks for coming.